Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the next hour. Just by way of quick introduction, my name is Janice Hutchinson, and I will be your host for the next hour. Um, I would like, before we start, just to take the opportunity to thank Food Standards Scotland, who sponsor the Industry Insights Programme with the Marketing Society. Um, before we kick off properly, just a quick summary of what we're going to cover off. We are going to spend the next hour talking about the importance of mental health as a strategic priority for businesses. I think as marketeers, everything links back to the purpose. And it's important to call out the purpose of the marketing society is all about empowering brave leaders. And I would really encourage you to listen carefully to the stories both John and Jeff are about to share. I think no matter what stage you're at in your leadership journey, whether you're a marketing executive starting off in your career or whether you're in a senior leadership role, everyone can take something away from today's webinar. And for that reason, we would like you to join in the Q&A. So please ask questions in the chat box as we go. Um, we're also encouraging people to join the conversation at hashtag Industry Insight and also on the Marketing Society Twitter, which is at Marketing S-O-C-S-C-O, -S just for those of you who don't know. Um, so before I give you a little overview of, of my background, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce both Johnny and Jeff. Um, so Johnny Jacobs is the finance director for Europe, Middle East and Africa for Starbucks. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Johnny directly now for probably about 15, 16 months on, on mental health initiatives. Um, he's been absolutely instrumental at helping us at ICAST shape our mental health strategy. And he's also incredibly passionate about breaking down the stigma. Um, he's done a phenomenal amount of work since he joined Starbucks. And prior to Starbucks, he was leading the way in his previous role at Platus. Um, Jeff is not an easy person to introduce because of the sheer amount of work he's done in, in the mental health and wellbeing field. Um, I had the privilege of hearing Jeff speak um, early in 2021 and without giving anything away it really resonated with me and it made me understand just the role every individual can take um, in setting up a well-being strategy. He's an ex-global HR executive for Unilever um, and he now campaigns for mental health and well-being on a global scale. What I would say is if you haven't taken the time to read Jeff's bio on the Marketing Society website, please just take two minutes because it is absolutely inspirational. Um, and probably what brings another interesting dynamic today is while Johnny and I know each other well, so do Jeff and Johnny, um, Jeff's based in Stellenbosch, just outside Cape Town. Johnny is in London and I'm in Edinburgh. And from, I guess, the sun coming into all of our rooms at the minute, yeah, it, it looks pretty warm everywhere, which is nice. Um, so just before I pass over to Johnny, a quick background on me and I guess ICAS and how we've got involved in the mental health and wellbeing space. So you might wonder why a marketing director is leading a strategic program um, on health and wellbeing. And I think there's probably two reasons from my perspective. One is brands and the customer are at the heart of everything a marketeer does and it brings a completely different perspective and the second is I've seen from personal experience what friends have gone through and some colleagues and actually the impact on business performance can be quite significant. Um, in terms of ICAS, for those of you who don't know, chartered accountants, we have over 23,000 members in over 100 countries around the world, many of whom are in leadership positions, um, like Johnny, he's one of our members. We also train over 3,000 students, um, and believe it or not, over half of those students are trained in London, and over half of our members are not based in Scotland. Um, I think in terms of our strategy on health and well-being, this time last year, to give you the context, we didn't have a strategic programme set up. Um, we were just kicking off discussions, and we've been incredibly fortunate and two fronts, one, to have the support of our chief executive and the executive team, and two, to have, I was given the opportunity to lead it, but also to set up a project team within ICAS. So we have staff from right across the business, working in all different areas, all different levels of responsibility, 
And I think it's that collective force of us as the project team, the chief exec support, and actually that guidance and working with Johnny that has really driven the step change. So on that note, I shall pass you across to Johnny, who's going to share his passion for mental health and wellbeing, and I guess how we came together through that shared purpose. And then once Johnny takes you through his story, he will then pass over to Jeff. But please, any questions, just pop them in the chat box as we go along. Thank you very much, Janice, for such an incredible introduction. And it's really wonderful to be here with, with you and Jeff today. Well, welcome everybody to what is Blue Monday, and hopefully we will uh, brighten up your day to the extent that, that we can. Well, as, as Janice says, I'm Johnny Jacobs, a finance director, and I hold a number of non-exec positions in the mental health space, including being a trustee for the Mental Health Foundation, which is the UK's leading charity for everybody's mental health. And also incredibly humbled to be working alongside Janice on the mental fitness and business strategy at ICAS that she mentioned, and we'll come on to talk about that in a minute. So for the next 10 minutes, um, I'll share a bit about why I'm here, the role of accountants, what we are doing at ICAST, and more importantly for this audience, the role of marketeers. And I've been a member for ICAST for over 20 years, and I actually got to know Janice initially through becoming what was called the, the Young Charter Accountant of the Year. Now, I came from a very troubled upbringing and very introverted and don't particularly like the spotlight. So you can imagine how nerve wracking that was to be yeah, to be put in that that situation. And and as part of that, I was asked to give the keynote speech at the admissions ceremony for chartered accountants. So this is effectively where about one and a half, two thousand students become um, chartered effectively. And it's a, it's, it's a big deal um, for those students graduating. It's a really, really, really nice, nice event. And I was asked to talk and I was so nervous, literally did not sleep for weeks prior to having um, to give this talk. And in prior years, when folk have gone up to talk um, to the students graduating, you can imagine they'll talk about accounting or order or governance or the role of the profession. Well, I spoke about something different. I spoke about mental health. And for me, this was a real pivotal moment. And I'll explain why in a minute. And Janice, you're in the audience that day. And I, like I say, I was very nervous, heart jumping out my chest. But straight afterwards, I get so many messages saying that somebody up there talking about mental health made such a huge difference. And if I can borrow a phrase actually from, uh, from Jeff McDonald, uh, if I may, Jeff, hope, hope you don't mind, and a real profound impact on me, which is around each time we share a story, we send a lifeboat of hope. And I realised, taking some inspiration from Jeff, you know, maybe, maybe my role is to send more lifeboats. Maybe the role of accountants is to send more lifeboats. In fact, maybe the role of marketeers even could be to send more lifeboats. So why am I talking about mental health? Well, I'm going to share a bit of my personal experiences to what led me to become a bit of an advocate um, in, in this space and also the role of accountants. And you can tell you know, by my accent, I'm Scottish, I'm from Glasgow. But what you probably don't know is that growing up for me was really tough. I felt like I didn't ever really fit in with those around me and there were a host of, of different reasons. And I was surrounded by mental ill health and personally ex experienced it myself, but also through friends and, and family. And at the age of 13, I got to my lowest place. My parents got divorced and it had a profound impact on me because unlike others, I was effectively left to bring myself up alone. My mother had moved away. I was living with my dad and we came from a working class family. He was out doing different jobs. My, my brother had, had moved out. And loneliness was a, was a real driver for me. And I wasn't surrounded by friends and family to help and support. And I really had to find my, my own way. First person in my family to go to university, what does it even look like? And navigate to try becoming um, a finance professional. So fast forward to 
2017, uh, and actually the same time as I gave that, that speech uh, for ICAS at the admission ceremony, I was also very privileged to be the strategy director at Pladis. And that year was really pivotal for Pladis. Pladis, a global snacking business that owns the likes of McVitie's Biscuits and, and Godiva Chocolate. And we'd signed a pledge, a pledge to end the stigma of mental health in a workplace. And you can imagine I gravitated towards that pledge um, and actually became the exec sponsor of the programme. And we created this most incredible, authentic programme to really try and support people in tough times, but also promote positive mental well-being. And we convinced the leadership team to sign the first social partnership between McVitie's, a mental health charity in mind. And it was a real grassroots initiative. And one key point in that that always stuck with me was the use of language. And I'm going to talk about that just now because I think that's particularly important for the marketing community. I remember going around the exec and saying, should we support and do something on mental health? And every time I said the words mental health, honestly, I could literally feel the stigma drop out my mouth and just land on the floor. Like stigma, staring at stigma. And the thing is, I don't think people are going to say, oh, we don't want to do anything on mental health. But when it comes to making it a strategic priority, when it comes to driving cultural change, when it comes to investing, maybe, maybe you get a bit of stickiness sometimes. And I remember going back and looking at the language within the organization and there were words such as happiness and positivity. And this amazing group came up with a program called Positive Minds. We went back around the same people and said, oh, we should do Positive Minds. They said, oh, that's a fantastic idea. Positive Minds is great. And I'm like, same thing, different language. And the reason why I mention that is that point around engagement and, and how do you get that message across is, is really, really important. So what about the role of, of accountants in driving forward mental fitness alongside marketeers, of course? And uh, why? I mean, I fundamentally believe that finance and accounting people are at the heart of organisations. We can influence agendas, we're close to leadership, and we also understand budgets and can hold the purse strings. In, in some cases. If you think of each of each of you in your organizations will have, you know, think of your CFO, think of your FD, and, and, and they've got influence. But like any roles and careers that come in all shapes and sizes, we also understand the importance of personal resilience. And the role can be mentally tough. I mean, some accounting roles don't have a huge sense of purpose, you know, working long hours, it's you know, the intensity around projects, perhaps the subject matter is less emotional. And there's also some troubling stats that back that up. I mean, it was a study that showed that over 70% of accounting and finance professionals surveyed said that they'd been impacted by stress at work. And they recognized that work was a key determinant of mental health. Over 70% also said that they won't talk to the line manager about their mental health. So hang a second, um, we recognize that, that we're impacted by mental health at work. We won't talk to line managers, but we're influential, we can make a change. And the cost of business is huge. I mean, there's a shocking, you know, we all know that the, 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 the moral argument, but there's a shocking statistics that every 40 seconds, somebody takes their own life. But the cost of business is huge, 45 billion in the UK, one trillion globally. But the ROI on spending on mental ill health prevention is, is really, really strong. If, if, I, if I said to you, think of your last marketing campaign or think of you know, some of the work that you're doing in your organization, and if I said, okay, give me a pound, I'll give you six pound back, you'd bite my hand off for it. If I said, give me four pound, you'd bite my hand off. That is the ROI that's shown when you invest in, in mental ill health prevention. And, and I think that it's, it's really, really important, but it's not just about investment. That's one part of the, of the, of the wider piece, but of course, an accountant, I feel compelled to talk about some numbers. So what is ICAS doing about it? Well, Janice and I, I guess we got to know each other through both the, the, the One Young CA, where she really saw me probably as a, as a more nervous, younger version of myself. Um, and I thought, how can we make the most of the platform? And we also have a shared interest in, in, in mental health. We've been working closely ever since. So what, what is ICAS doing? Well, they set a really ambitious goal to lead the way around mental fitness, to really support and champion mental health and well-being for ICAS colleagues, students and members. And it's about shifting hearts and minds in the profession. And they made a pledge around healthy minds start here. And this strategy was launched. It was quite a big deal, actually. This strategy was launched 
and a dedicated issue of the Charter Accountancy magazine focused purely on mental fitness and also focused, for example, a key summit around it, as well as launching things like a student um, helpline. But what's been incredible is the momentum, is the authenticity, the integrity around it. So what are the objectives? Year one, remove stigma. Year two, have the capability to support colleagues and students. And year three, can, can ICAST be the gold standard and really lead the way? And I do ask myself, how is, how is ICAST making so much progress and how it can be so effective? And I'll share my perspective of marketing teams having worked I've been privileged to work with many marketing teams across different organizations. And I can tell you that what Janice and team is doing is genuinely exceptional. First of all, Janice, you know, she's a leader in the organization, can work in partnership with HR to make change. It's really important. And with that, being a marketing can consistently incorporate mental well-being into strategies and contributing to the wider business strategy. And we see it show up. We see it show up internally and externally across the different facets of the organization. Also building mental and um, the mental well-being narrative into comms. I mean, the content team sits and and this team and can really drive some of um, some of those comms and get that message out there. I also think marketeers are used to managing complex initiatives, programs, uh, projects. And this is another. This is an example um, of what ICAST is trying to achieve. And I think really importantly, it's that blue sky thinking, that unconstrained thinking. And how can you apply? those principles into this space. And we saw that, you know, we, if you think there's white space, there's white space here to be had. We saw that with, with McBitties as well. You say, well, what role has a biscuit got to play in mental health, but tea talk of the biscuit? Well, what role has accountants got to play in mental health? And, and I think that's where marketers can really come in. What's really important is it's done with a deep sense of authenticity and humility, and it's, it's really integrated and part of a program that's genuinely is making change and, and, and driving change. And like I said, I don't profess to be a, an expert in marketing in any way, shape or form. I'm just giving you, giving you my perspective. Um, there are some key takeaways and, and Janice touched on them and we'll probably talk about them later, is why also why it's been quite successful is around that engagement at the top, the engagement throughout the organisation and also tying it into the wider IND agenda. But we can come on to, we can come on to that later. So I guess that's, that's it um, from me for now. Um, hopefully giving you a flavour of what ICAST is trying to achieve, the role of accountants, but more importantly um, for today, the role of marketeers and the role that marketeers can play. And it is, I think for me, it's about developing the language, the strategies, building into to plans and how all of that can, can sit around it. So it's a real privilege for me to hand over to a big inspiration of mine, Jeff McDonald. I've known Jeff for, for a few years and it's fair to say, You've certainly supported me on my journey of discovery around mental well-being. So over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Johnny. And uh, hello to everybody who's joined us uh, today. Um, and I know Janice was saying, why don't we just try and keep this as uh, relaxed and informal as possible? So I'm feeling kind of relaxed and fairly informal because I'm sitting on a wine farm uh, in Stellenbosch, in the most beautiful setting in the world. And as I look out over these mountains ahead of me, I, I think about Mark Twain, who I think once said, the two most important days in your life, what are they? And you know, when I ask audiences around the world that question, the most common response that I get is that Mark Twain said that the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we die. And I always reflect on those answers and I think about the human species and I wonder why we're so pessimistic about life that we can't wait for the second most important day in our life, which is gonna be the day that I die. So, you know, stick me in an incubator on day two, switch all the machines off, let me die and everybody will be very chuffed and happy and it'll be an important day. And of course, Mark Twain didn't say that. He said the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we find out why we were born. Why? And I wonder how many of you have thought about that why. As marketing professionals, thought about a why which goes beyond being a good marketeer or a good leader or a good father or mother or brother or sister. But maybe three questions you want to ask yourself. One, what do you truly, truly care about? 
Secondly, what are you really good at? And thirdly, what is the legacy you one day want to leave when you move on from this world? And I'm very clear on my own why, and it's a very simple why. And that is to try and create workplaces. And you know, not only workplaces, we should have family groups. We should have friendship groups where every single person in that setting feels that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and to just ask for some help if they are struggling with a common form of mental ill health, a common form, depression, anxiety, bipolar. And I don't think that that's a very noble, authentic, audacious, well, I think it's authentic, but it's not, a, it's not a hugely noble or audacious purpose of mine. And let me tell you why. Because in every family group, in every friendship group, in every workplace, anywhere around the world, if you had a common physical illness, you'd put your hand up and ask for some help. Yet in the 21st century, we live in a world where there are workplaces, where there are family groups, where there are friendship groups, where people feel embarrassed, scared, ill, ashamed, Just put their hand up and ask for some help if they are struggling emotionally or mentally. How can that be? How can that be in the 21st century when all of us on this call today, all of us are mental, all of us are emotional, all of us are physical, and some of us would say we're all spiritual as well. Yet we really struggle to talk about our mental and emotional struggles when we need to. Now you might say to me, well, why Jeff? Why are you so passionate about trying to create that kind of world? Why did you leave Unilever at the end of 2014 to go out into the world and live this life fueled by a deep, deep sense of purpose? And the reason for that is back in 2008, I was diagnosed with anxiety-fueled depression. At that time, I was looking after the home and personal care categories around the Unilever world from an HR point of view. And I got very, very ill with anxiety-fueled depression. And you know, when I left the doctor's rooms after getting my diagnosis, and I'll never forget the date, it was the 25th of 26th of January, 2008. It was my daughter's 13th birthday. I had not been able to engage and participate in her birthday at all. And when I walked out of the doctor's rooms and I had this diagnosis, I made a decision as I walked out the doctor's rooms not to be burdened by the stigma that is associated with depression, with anxiety. Now, I was really lucky in some ways to be able to make that decision. And there were a couple of things in my favor. The first is my personality. I'm the sort of guy, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So what you see is what you get. Look me in the eye and you'll see there's something wrong. I am so grateful for that kind of personality. Secondly, I was 20 years into a career with Unilever. I was in a senior HR job. I built all my credibility. I wasn't a young graduate or middle manager or a junior manager thinking about creating a career in Unilever and therefore didn't think I could talk about my mental illness at the time. I built 20 years of credibility. The third reason I was really, really lucky is that I'd been given a diagnosis. I kind of felt liberated by the diagnosis. But probably the most important was I had a line manager, and some of you might know him because he was the chief marketing officer for Unilever at the end of his career, Keith Weed. And I was working with Keith at the time, and he had a compassionate relationship to mental ill health. I was so lucky. He understood. He empathized. And, you know, I had to take three months off work. And during those three months while I was off work, I had dark, dark moments. I had moments when I didn't think life was worth living. I was a burden to everybody around me. The world would be better off without me. And in my darkest moments, in my darkest, darkest moments, there was one thing that kept me alive. And I was able to experience this because I'd been so open about my illness. I'd spoken to some of my friends, some of my colleagues, my family. And you know what I got from all of them that kept me alive in my darkest, darkest moments? 
what I got back from every single person who knew about my illness was the most wonderful outpouring of the most powerful emotion in the world. And do you know what it's called? It's called love. It's called love. And do you know, in my darkest moments, just knowing that I had a 10 year old at the time who loved me, I had a line manager who loved me. I had a friend who loved me, a wife. And that sense of feeling loved, together with a sense of hope. I used to meet with a colleague every 10 days during my illness. And this colleague of mine, two years prior, had been so sick, he had been admitted to the priory. I was never admitted to hospital. And I used to meet with Martin every 10 days. And you know what I saw? I saw he was better. Do you know what he gave me? He gave me hope. He gave me that little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And yes, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, medication, slowly getting back onto my bicycle and doing some exercise. Those things worked for me. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for everybody. But you know what I think can work for every single person who might be struggling? As part of their recovery, the two most powerful emotions in the world. A sense of feeling loved and a sense of hope. And yes, I get better. I recover. I go back into Unilever. 2010, I have a bit of a relapse. Nothing as bad as 2008. And then in October of 2012, I lose a very good friend to suicide. And the night he died, I lie in bed and I think to myself, what's the difference between him and I? Here I am in 2012 now, four years after my crucible moment, flourishing in many ways as a human being learning every single day and to maintain my recovery through a disciplined regime that I have every single day to maintain my recovery as somebody who is susceptible to anxiety, fuel, depression, and he's gone. And I lie there and I think to myself, what's the difference? And I come to two simple conclusions. The first is I've been able to talk. I've been able to experience a sense of love and a sense of hope. He couldn't. Alpha male Africana South African. There's no ways he could talk about his mental and emotional struggles. And I lay there and I thought, you know what? Stigma. Johnny was talking about the word stigma earlier. Stigma has just killed my friend. Stigma has just killed my friend. And I thought to myself, that's not fair. That's not fair. How can that be in the 21st century? Had he had a common physical illness, what would he have done? He would have gone to see a doctor. He would have spoken to his wife. He might have spoken to me. But because he was struggling mentally and emotionally, he didn't think he could talk. And instead, he died by suicide. And I lay there that night and I thought, I have to do something about this. But I didn't know where to start. And so that night, I Googled a guy in the UK who I knew was influential. He knew lots of people. He was doing some campaigning. I just thought, if I could just meet with him, he would begin to open some doors and introduce me to some people. And so that night I wrote to Alistair Campbell, who used to work for Tony Blair. Within 10 minutes, I had a response from Alistair. 10 days later, we met up in Belsize Park, close to where he lives. And ever since that day, he began to open some doors and introduce me to some people, which allowed me to take tiny, tiny footsteps on a journey filled with a deep, deep sense of purpose. And that is to create workplaces, the workplaces you all work in, the friendship groups that you have, the families that you are part of, to create those kind of environments where every single person feels that they genuinely have the choice, genuinely have the choice to just put their hand up and ask for some help if they're struggling with a common form of mental ill health. I led a piece of work in Unilever for about a year and a half around breaking stigma, and then I decided to leave Unilever at the end of 2014 to go out into the world and journey this path. And you know, well, not for one minute, ladies and gentlemen, am I saying to you today that had my friend been able to talk, he would be alive today. I can't say that. I can't say had he been able to have a conversation, he'd be alive. But you know what I can say? Is had he been able to have just one conversation, just one conversation, I want you to think of a grain of sand. There is a tiny, tiny chance he would still be alive today. Tiny. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, as I speak to you right now, there are billions of people all over the world suffering in silence. And to give each of them that tiny chance to just have one conversation 
that might just save their lives. That is worth fighting for every single day of our lives and of my life. And my challenge to you today as marketing professionals, as senior leaders maybe in marketing functions, what are you doing? What are you doing to create an environment where every single person who works with you and for you feels that they genuinely, genuinely have that choice to just turn to you and to ask for some help? You might just save a life. And as I journeyed this path, I've learned all sorts of things over the last nine years. And probably one of the most biggest insights that I've had since leaving Unilever and doing this work around the world in different sectors is that the most limiting resource that I see in workplaces today, you know what it is? The most limiting resource. It's not the quality of the brands, the quality of the people, the product or the service that you're offering. The most limiting resource that I see in workplaces today is the energy of people. People are frazzled. They are frazzled. You can't wait for a Friday afternoon and you don't really look forward to a Monday morning. And if you don't believe me, read Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer's book, Dying for the Paycheck from Stanford University. He's done all the longitudinal research that shows the impact that workplaces are having on people's lives, on their well-being, on their livelihoods, on their ability to connect, to live life to the full. And you know what I would argue is that the most important enabler of performance at an individual level, at a team level, at an organizational level, the most critical enabler to performance is the energy of your people. The energy of your people. Your energy as a leader, you know what it's like to work for a leader who radiates energy versus a leader who I call a drain, who sucks every bit of energy out of you. You know what it's like to work for a team that is filled with energy and passion to get the task done. Yet we've somehow created workplaces today where we suck every bit of energy out of people. And you know where we get our energy from? We get our energy from our well-being, from our well-being from being physically healthy, emotionally healthy, mentally healthy, and some would say spiritually healthy. And so my challenge to all of you is if the energy of your people is such a critical enabler to performance, and if we get our energy from our well-being, my question is, why is the well-being of your people not a strategic priority? Not in the HR function, but at an executive level. Why is it not a strategic priority? Because I bet you every single one of your strategic priorities is about enabling the performance of your organization. So why is the well-being of your people not there? Why is it a week called the well-being week, where we have a week where we care for your well-being for a week of the year, and then we flog you to death for the other 51? Or in the old days, when we were all in offices, we have a few bananas next to the till in the canteen. Or yes, no, we've given you a Headspace app, so we care for you. Look after your well-being. What is strategic about that? And so what I want to leave you with today is just some thoughts and some ideas. And I've made sure that these two slides are available. But I'm just going to leave you with a little framework around what I think it looks like if you were to elevate the well-being of your people to being a strategic priority. And I think the first thing that you would have to do is you'd have to define for yourself as an organization or within your own function, within the marketing function, define what you mean by well-being. And in this framework, I've used a little triangle, the Warwick Edinburgh Well-Being Index, which defines well-being as being your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health, and having that sense of purpose and meaning in your life. And so you'd all need to have done that as an organization, define that framework, and then made sure that you've got resources in place that employees can draw on to develop all elements of that framework, all elements of their wellness. You would have addressed the stigma of mental ill health right across your organization. You would have invested a year and a half, two years in truly addressing stigma. And we address stigma by doing simple things like educating people, like campaigning. You know, as marketeers, you know what I'd love us to, I'd love to see? I'd love us to see, you know, brand mental health. It's the most damaged brand I've ever come across. It's the most damaged brand I've ever come across, brand mental health. When the person uses the word mental health, they go to illness. 
They go to depression, they go to anxiety, they go to bipolar. When I use the word physical health, people don't immediately go to illness. If I walk into a Nike store in Regent Street, all I see on the walls are chiseled whippets, people with beautiful bodies, these images of physical health and beauty. And what do I do? I go off and I buy a pair of running shoes because I don't look the same. When it comes to mental health, what are the images we see? Jeff McDonald with his head in his hands, some black and white photograph, somebody in a mental asylum. What is inspirational and aspirational about looking after our mental well-being? And so as marketeers, could you develop some campaigns where you begin to create a more positive brand around mental well-being, mental fitness, as Johnny might have used the term? So yes, addressing stigma is going to be absolutely critical if you were to elevate the well-being and the mental health of your people to being a strategic priority. The other thing that you would need to do is you'd need to put a measure in place, measure the well-being of your people. And then HR functions say to me, no, we do. I say, where? They say, no, in the engagement survey, we ask a few questions around well-being. That's not good enough. It's not good enough. You know, when it comes to safety, we have measures around safety. We spend billions in health and safety. Guess what? It all goes to safety, keeping people physically safe at work. An engagement survey measures my willingness to go the extra mile. It, me it measures my, my pride in the organization. You know what it doesn't measure? It doesn't measure my ableness to go the extra mile. How able am I to go the extra mile? And so having a well-being survey where every year or every two years, we get a sense of the, of the we get a measure around the well-being of our people. Why? Because it drives the energy. Why? Because it's the most important driver of your performance. And also through that survey, we can understand the ways of working in the organization. You know, we can't just throw apps at people and resources at people and say to them, use all that stuff and you improve your well-being. If the ways of working in the organization are causing the stress, are causing the pain. And so we've got to look at that and audit that and understand what is it that we can change to create an environment where people can truly flourish. And then finally, as an organization, I think we need to look at the leadership development models and the competency models in organizations. And we need to include well-being as being a, a, an aspect of behavior that we expect of our leaders. How do they look after their own well-being? How do they role model looking after the most important enabler of their performance, their energy and their well-being? And so that's what I think we would see at an organizational level, an organization taking true accountability over a three-year period and executing that strategy and putting the financial and human resource behind it like we would any other strategic priority. And then finally, we need to drive some individual accountability. We need to drive some individual accountability in the organization. And there I would like us to have well-being plans, future fit plans for every single person in an organization, not just a skills development plan or a coach to help you with your behaviors or a career plan. Every single person should have a future fit plan, a plan whereby they're gonna use the resources that you've made available to those people to enhance the most critical enabler of their performance, their energy and their well-being. So ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you get a sense today as to why I'm so passionate about trying to address the stigma of mental ill health across organizations all over the world. Hopefully I've also tried to make a bit of a case for you as to why well-being should be a strategic priority in your organization. And hopefully I've left you with some thoughts and some ideas on what would that look like? And we will circulate that slide and one other slide where you might be able to use that as a bit of a framework to begin this conversation. But I can't leave you today, I can't leave you today without asking each of you to think about joining me on my crusade, joining Johnny on his crusade in trying to create workplaces all over the world that are devoid of stigma. And I would ask you to think about doing three things as an individual marketeer. And you don't have to wait for your organization to do any of this for you. Three things that you could do to lead for creating an organization where people truly flourish, where people feel that they are truly psychologically safe and can talk about this stuff. And there are three things I'd like you to consider doing to join me and Johnny on our crusade. The first is reflect on your own relationship to mental ill health. What is that relationship? What is your relationship to mental ill health? Is it a relationship of true compassion and empathy? Or is it a relationship of real intolerance where you see people like me as a snowflake? You haven't got time for us who might have struggled with mental ill health conditions. And for those of you that are intolerant around this subject, I ask you to do one thing for me. Just go and be curious. Please just go and be curious. 
go and read, go and learn, go and talk to somebody who struggled in the past. And if you can't find anybody in your circle of friends or your family, and by the way, I don't believe that, go and talk to a homeless person. They'll tell you what it's like to be depressed, to be anxious. So all of you can reflect on your own relationship. The second thing you can all do is you can all just keep this conversation going in your organization, or you can start this conversation in your organization. Because I honestly believe that every single conversation, if we can just have the conversation, anything will be possible. Anything will be possible. John F. Kennedy once started a conversation about putting a man on the moon and bringing him back safely. Guess what? It happened from one conversation in the White House. So keep the conversation going, get this conversation going, and you will work it out. You will work it out how to create a culture and an environment where people truly flourish. And then finally, as Johnny said, when you're ready, when you're ready, please tell your story. Because we've all got a story. We've all got a story. Now, not all of us have got a story like mine or like Johnny's, but we've all got a story. We've all got some association with mental ill health. And if you're going to tell a story of somebody else, please get their permission first, please. But my experience has shown that storytelling is the most powerful lever in addressing stigma. It is the most powerful lever. And it doesn't have to be a story like mine. It can be the story of a third party. And I'll just end and give you an example of that. David Blanchard, chief scientist in Unilever while I was working for Unilever. As we encourage leaders to tell their stories, he came into the office one day and he wrote a blog to his 3,000 scientists all over the world. And the title of the blog was, what is it like to be the father of a daughter who suffers from general anxiety disorder? Now he got his daughter and his wife's permission before he wrote the blog. And when he published that blog, do you know the Bangalore scientist, the lady in Bangalore, she knew that she had a boss who had a compassionate relationship to mental ill health, a compassionate relationship. And the reason I ask you to think about telling your story, when you feel ready to tell it, when you feel supported, maybe a bit of coaching, you've got the right permissions. As Johnny said, every story that we tell, every story that we tell is like sending a lifeboat out into the ocean. And you know the billions of people who are suffering in silence right now as you listen to myself and Johnny, when they hear that story, they cling onto the lifeboat. And you know what they realize? They realize two things. The first thing they realize is they're not alone. And the second thing they realize is they're just normal. They are just normal human beings like you, and like me. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jeff and Johnny. That was absolutely brilliant and just great to hear some of the stories. Um, I think just picking up on one of the points you made, Jeff, around the brand mental health, I, I, I think, and Johnny, you alluded to it as well when you talked about trying to get a little bit of momentum. I think it's something we've really tried to learn from within ICAST, so working with yourself, Johnny, and in terms of how we launched the campaign and the marketing approach around our mental fitness strategy, it's all around the pledge and it's healthy mind start here. Um, and I think it's just when you both talk, you talk about the little things that can make a big difference and something that we did, it sounded really insignificant, but for Mental Health Week back in October last year, we sent every member of staff in ICAST a letter from the chief executive and a little well-being box, which had, I can't remember, it had popcorn, it had little treats, it had a notebook, and it basically encouraged every single team in, in the business to take 30 minutes or an hour out of their schedule and actually just have a coffee and a catch up together. Um, and I can only share from my team, but when we did it, we covered topics from mental ill health to divorce, to property, to children, and actually, it was probably, if I'm being honest, one of the best team sessions we had last year because people did really open up. And I think it just reinforced that actually people are human beings. They're real. They 
everybody comes to work because they want to make work, the world of work, a better place. But actually, as leaders and businesses, we need to take that seriously and, and need to support it. So just very quickly, um, a couple of questions coming in. That, so here's one from Suzanne. I work for an organisation where wellbeing is a strategic priority, but I worry about those who are early career and don't have a good network. Do you have any experience of this? So I will pass that over to yourself, Johnny and Jeff. Thank you. Will I, will I go first? Um, okay. Um, and, and I think that's a, it is a real concern. I mean, you think of all of the, the graduates, apprentices, interns that are joining organisations right now that perhaps aren't meeting face-to-face. -face. And we talk about hybrid working and hybrid working is, is, is most definitely got its uh, merits and, and its real positives and how we can try and navigate through the pandemic and what type of flexible working do we have going forward? All of that's a big question to be answered. But within that, you have hundreds and thousands of people coming in who potentially are not building all of those connections. So I think I think that is a really important question and something for us to focus on. I guess some of the things which I've certainly seen work from my own personal experience, particularly for more junior members of staff and, and younger people, is having those coaches and mentors, having that pastoral support. And creating networks, creating peer-to-peer -peer networks within that and creating environments and space to, to have conversations. And it, it, it's important because particularly if you're, maybe if you've got less work experience as well, then perhaps you haven't built up that same sense of resiliency or that same sense of perspective as well. So I think organisations can also try and tailor some of the tools and resources they have to earlier careers and, and at the same time try and build those networks to to support and that's just purely some personal experience um i'll, I'll hand over to jeff look i, I mean i'm not going to add too much to that uh, johnny you know i think each of us as we um as we get used to this new way of working uh where hopefully people are coming into the office at least maybe two or three times a week i think we've just got to become more conscious about how do we create these opportunities for uh, connection for those creative sparks to take place across a water cooler or whatever the case might be. So I think we, we need to be more mindful of thinking of ways in which we create these connections. But you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, and this is why I come back to, you know, how do you, it, it's all about the culture of the organization. And how do we create a culture? And, and or how do we shift a culture where the well-being of our people is really, really seen to be important? And for me, you know, you shift culture by doing two things. One, by having leaders who are going to role model stuff and are going to behave in the right kind of way. But also by shifting some of the policies, some of the processes, some of the systems in the organization, because they also drive behavior. And that's why I'm so intent about trying to encourage organizations to, as part of their development process, as part of the way in which they develop people, we expect everybody as part of their development conversation to be having a conversation about their well-being. You know, and, and, and we don't need to get too scientific about this, but just like you would have a conversation with one of your subordinates around their skills to do the job, or you'd have a conversation with them around their career, and you do that twice a year as part of the whole performance management system or the development approach in that organization. I think we should be encouraging every single line manager to be having conversations with their people around the most critical enabler of their performance. And if then in that conversation, you know, my inability to connect is impacting my well-being because it does, it impacts your emotional health, then that line manager can work with that individual to find ways to help them to connect better. And so I think we've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we can't just leave it up to a couple of emotionally intelligent line managers like Johnny to have well-being conversations with their people. We should try and ensure that everybody is having that conversation. And we do it by addressing some of the process, the system and the policy in the organization. So, so I think Johnny's given some good examples of the kinds of things and be mindful of connection and how do you make more connection but I also think we should build into the development ethos, a conversation around the most important enabler of that individual's performance, and that's their health. 
Thank you both very much. And um, we've got another couple of questions. One is, what are your top tips for preventing burnout in very busy professions or organisations? Okay, Johnny, shall I go first on this? And and uh, this is and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you I'm gonna leave you with a little acronym. That well, let me go back a step. In order to prevent burnout, you you as an individual need to prioritize your health. You need to decide for yourself, where is it on your list of priorities? And if on a scale of naught to five, zero, it's low priority, and five, it is the most important priority in my life, my health. If it is a zero, one, or two, <laughs> you will not prevent burnout. If you make your well-being and your health a four or a five, the most important priority in your life, then I honestly believe by putting certain boundaries in place every single day, you will be able to prevent burnout. And I have a very simple acronym that I'm gonna leave you with. And Janice, you might wanna put it into the chat. It's called can do. I said in my little session, I said, I am very disciplined every single day about dedicating time to maintain my recovery as an anxiety fuel depressive. And can do stands for, I will dedicate 60 to 90 minutes every single day to the simple acronym. The C in can do stands for connect. Connect with a friend, connect with nature, connect with a member of my family. Five minutes, 10 minutes, every single day, do a bit of connection. The A stands for be active. A for active. Go for a walk around the block. Go for a bit of a run. Just find 30 minutes, 50 minutes, 20 minutes, do a bit of yoga, but just be active every single day. The N stands for, just try and be nice to somebody, so two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, just be nice to somebody every single day. See what that does to a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. The A in active is good for your physical health. The C is good for your emotional health, connecting. The D stands for discover, learn something new, be curious. It's good for your mental health. Five minutes, listen to a podcast. Do a Sudoku, do a crossword, do a jigsaw puzzle, but just take, just take 10 minutes every single day to just discover and be curious. And then finally, the O in can do stands for observe. Every two hours, take a five minute observation break where you do nothing, you do nothing. You switch your laptop off, you switch your mobile phone off and you just go outside, you stand in the daylight and you listen to the birds sing or you listen to some favorite music, or you do some meditation or some mindfulness, but every two hours, just take five minutes. And you know, I dedicate 60 minutes every single day to can do, 60 minutes. People say to me, where do you get 60 minutes from? Well, I say to them, my health is the most important priority in my life. And you know what? There are 1,440 minutes in every day. 1,440 minutes in every single day. Have you not got 60 for yourself? And if you can't go with 60, then go with 15 or go with 10. But if we are going to prevent people from burning out, two things have to be in place. One, we need to shift our mindset as how important our health is to us as an individual. And then employ and do a little bit of can do. Maybe you don't do all of it, but do what really resonates for you. And I'm sure that if you encourage and if you yourself role model that as a leader and you encourage others to do that, you will prevent burnout. There was some research recently did done over the pandemic. Some people who'd burnt out and others who hadn't burnt out. And you know what one of the differences was? People who had not burnt out, do you know what they had? A dog. They had a dog. And you know what they used to do? They took the dog for a walk twice a day. It helped to prevent burnout. It can be as simple as that. Over to you, Johnny. Thank you, Jeff. Not sure how I'm going to uh, follow that. But I guess what I'd love to do is compliment everything that, that you've said and just echo it as well, because if I give my own flavor to some of can do and, and, and some of the teams I'm working in, we're talking about our well-being objectives, which is similar to what you were describing a moment ago. And I thought actually I would just share with you um, what are some of my well-being objectives. And what what was really what, what really came to life for me is that when I thought about the things that gave me positive mental and physical well-being, it wasn't necessarily the traditional things that people would often go to. It's not always doing mindfulness or meditation or yoga or going for a run. There's lots of other things. And a few things for me is meetings, walking meetings, standing up meetings. If, if I don't go out and get my steps in, I feel really lethargic. It's really important for me. And 
I say that openly to my team. Go for a walking meeting, get your walking boots on, or go outside or whatever works for you. But and be open about it. It's okay to be open. I've said to my team, you know, me going out and spending time walking really, really helps my well-being. And that's something that I really want to prioritize. I've looked at my working from home setup and realized, you know what, it wasn't that inspiring. It wasn't that inspiring at all. How can you make it more inspiring, make it a bit a little bit more creative? And we know that creativity can really help your mental well-being as well. Reading, I've realized that taking time out to actually read and absorb really helps me. But then when do you find the time to read? But then to your point, Jeff, there's plenty of minutes in a day. Even if I was to find an hour a week to actually read and not scroll, and then I've got into the, the method of sharing it back, some of my learnings, like, whoa, I feel like I've gone to a different place. And another couple of things that really helped me is obviously family time. We have a, a new baby. Um, which is really exciting right now. It's our first. And I've said I will be the best bedtime storyteller. And it's something I'm going to do. And I'm going to be the person that makes breakfast the best. I'm going to do that. And if there's two things I do in a day, it will be get that Weetabix ready and, and do that. And also read a story. And that really helps. And, and, and the fifth thing that I have on my own well-being objectives is around social impact doing something purposeful. And you showed that on the on the, the, the triangle diagram you had earlier. And, and I think that's really important. You have that sense of purpose. And just to finish up to say, if you look at the last two themes of Mental Health Awareness Week, the Shrumbed Mental Health Foundation, they were focused on kindness and focused on nature. And there's lots of science out there that says those people that are perpetually kind have lower stress and they live longer. So if there's any, any reason to, to be kind, it should live longer. And nature, spending time in nature. So I, I think all of these things, they might seem tangential, they might not seem that obvious, but find what works for you. And to Jeff's point, it's how do you make it a priority? Thank you very much. Um, I actually can't believe that that's almost our up. So Probably just to summarise, we will share some of those key learnings and um, particularly the can do. It's been put in the chat, I'm sure, between the Marketing Society and ICAST. We will also share on our social channels. Um, and just really to wrap up, um, there are two key dates coming up for the Marketing Society. One is 14th of February, which is the entry date for the Star Awards please enter. I know my team are avidly working on our entries already um, and hopefully we will be fortunate enough to be shortlisted and maybe even win this year. And the next is the next industry insight session is with DC Thompson in Dundee on the 28th of April. Um, thank you very much for joining today. A huge thank you to, to Jeff and John A. And if anyone has listened today and would like more information, please reach out either to me directly or be the Marketing Society. And I know if I end up getting in touch with either Johnny or Jeff, they'd be more than delighted to help. So thank you very much to the Marketing Society for allowing us, ICAST, to partner with them today and really kick off the Insight Series on, on such a really important strategic topic. Um, so thank you very much. I think that's us finished.